How's it going everyone? Tazen here. So about a month or so after my last video, uh, one of my parents got diagnosed with renal cancer and about two or three months after that, my other parent got rushed to hospital with suffocation due to swelling in the throat and a few days later we found out that that parent also had cancer, unfortunately an aggressive fast growing form of lymphoma that had spread to the throat and uh, since then we've just been in a, a big battle for both my parents. Uh, at times one of them living in a cancer ward, uh, chemotherapy non-stop until about two months ago. Um, we received good news that um, that parent is uh, stable, at least at the moment, and the other parent um, managed to stabilize after losing a kidney. But what I wanted to do was, in a time where I'm very grateful for the condition they're in right now, the fact that they're still here, um, and I can enjoy so much time with them, um, and appreciate that time a lot, I thought, There'd be nothing more special for me than to share how my parents introduced me to video games as a child and how through things that they did for me and shared with me growing up um, helped not only introduce but allow me to experience or be influenced or shaped in certain directions that um, has me enjoying, you know, the hobby in the way I do today. So. Going right back to, I guess, birth or early years, walking and so on. Obviously, this is all during the time of CRT TVs. Uh, I think we still had black and white one. And um, I was born into a household with a much older sibling um, who wasn't really into gaming, um, at least to my knowledge. But because of that, there was um, a gaming console in the household. And that was the very first console I've ever played. Something I've never talked about, I don't know if any of you might know it, but I actually still have it with me to this day. And that is, I guess you could call it our family's first gaming console. It is called a Hanamex. So it is almost like an Atari. It was, um, to my knowledge, maybe something like a clone console, but it says here Hanamex programmable video system. It is RF only. Um, it has two controllers that are actually tied to it. This is one, the knob's missing there. Um, but uh, this is something that I obviously grew up with as my first experience in gaming. It's very much like early Atari games. I have still some of the boxes for the cartridges here. So one is classic pinball. Another one is this spider's web one here, but um, I still got the cartridges. So. Invaders, which is technically Space Invaders. I remember playing that. I think it was a black and white TV we had and obviously with the RF signal in hindsight or, you know, plug into the antenna. Not that good quality, but that was all I knew and that was always available. Spider's Web is another one. There's the pinball game. And here is an Olympics collection. So it's got ping pong, hockey, tennis, volleyball, basketball and breakthrough slash knockout. So really, I got to, through my parents having gotten this, um, likely long before I was born, um, for my brother or just them to share with on, you know, some of their first TVs. I got to be born into a household where, although it was a time where the NES was out, Super Nintendo was also out at the time, um, I believe, early night I'm not sure if it was late 80s Super Nintendo came out or it was the early 90s or something but around that time obviously when I was playing this there was obviously much better uh, consoles but because of this I got to experience games almost in some of the most basic forms you know nothing gets simpler than uh, ping pong and so on so it meant I really got to develop an interest in games um, an appreciation for games um, to this day that is still quite, I guess, basic in that sense, or you could almost say like historically some of the earlier home console
games, so I love games like that still to this day, arcade games, so it's very easy for me to play anything on an Atari or so on, you know, early NES and stuff like that. But um, going from there, obviously, this was the kickstart where I felt a real enjoyment and wanting to play more. And then the Game Boy came out and my father, who was traveling overseas quite often, I believe to America, um, one day came back and he had a original gray Game Boy for me and that became my console. So obviously this is this is handheld, but for me that was just something that was out of this world. And uh, going from this Hanamex to the um, Game Boy, quite comparable. You know, obviously the huge advantage was I had a portable experience, but obviously I was reliant on AA batteries, so when they'd run out, I have to wait to see if my parents. Um, would be able to get some replacement batteries um, and there was no backlight or anything but what's special about that is to this day although I unfortunately don't have the Game Boy I regrettably traded in when I was young I still have all those games or at least almost all of them if there's any missing it's somewhere around here but uh, just recently going through the shed with uh, my mother we managed to find all the original manuals. So I thought instead of getting out the games that they got me, I'll show you the manuals to them. So here's obviously the original manuals for the OG Game Boy. So I'm glad that although I trade the Game Boy in, I've still got the manual. So it's something that I can sort of cherish and it helps remind me of those experiences. Original Space Invaders manual. So this is something I played a lot on the Game Boy. Donkey Kong, absolute classic to me. So this is the Donkey Kong where the first part of it is like the arcade version. Then you go off into this world where you're playing as Mario, rescuing, I can't remember if it was Peach or Rosalina um, or so on, but rescuing one of the princesses from uh, Donkey Kong. And then uh, I got Aladdin. And some of these, it says like it's USA version because um, my dad will get these when he's in America or in the um, airport. And honestly, like, looking at the condition of these manuals, they're near perfect. Uh, Double Dragon, this was a classic. I love playing this and just beating it on loop. Uh, Warrior Land, Super Mario Land 3. So it's funny because I found this manual with my mum, but I can't remember um, whatever happened to this game. So that might still be out there. Um, a copy of Star Wars Return of the Jedi. It's missing the front cover. And then we get into sort of the, the next stage of where gaming took me. So we had this amazing TV show on mornings here in Australia called Cheese TV. And it was these uh, two or th three young hosts at a later point um, that sort of introduced Australia, or at least um, Australia in the larger sense, to anime. So there was some select anime on other channels and so on, but this was this sort of like hub where every kid or, you know, young adult or even older would gather 7 a.m. to 8.30 and watch three different shows. There would be a half an hour segment for each show with a few like comedy skits and competition stuffs in between. But Pokemon came on and I remember seeing the very first episode being so blown away by it. I'd never seen any type of animated show with that aesthetic and style and with a story that would carry over episode to episode and be distinctly like one episode within the next episode would have some continuation or so, or at least in certain arcs. And then the Pokemon games got released here. So this is red, blue, and then later yellow. So for me, hearing about like everyone at school would like, which Pokemon game do you get, red or blue? And seeing that you could actually play like Ash Ketchum, you know, playing as the character Riddle, however you chose to name him, and you get the starter Pokemon that you could choose, one of the three, um, go through the world, I really wanted to get this. So my parents were so amazing to have bought me Pokemon Red, and this is where everything starts to sort of like, how do I say, we see sort of like the um, defining points in what led me to sort of my huge love of JRPGs and stuff, and RPGs in general. And it's because Pokemon, because that was an RPG. And uh, we managed to actually find the original manual, not in the best condition, or at least the cover, but everything inside is all there. That's for my Pokemon Red. And um, 
that just blew me away and obviously I didn't really know much other than some of the basic Atari style games um, and then some of the games on the NES and Super Nintendo that I was playing at friend's house but I don't know if Pokemon came before that or after for me at least in my experiences but it really was the defining moment where I was really loving the way you could take turns and choose your attacks and you really had to be strategic and figure out you know sort of their weaknesses can you risk taking um, chances on a certain attack if your health is a certain level and you might not have the money to buy potions um, or the amount you need and so on and uh, catching all the Pokemon, you know, it was just something so cool and then catching up with kids at school and I remember this is the early days where you had to re use link cables and I've still got my original link cables um, so I'm really glad I've still got things like that but um, obviously this is my, gave me the introduction to RPGs but then the next step that took me into JRPGs specifically um, and games really compelling, compelling stories and stories being the focal point of what I'm interested in when it comes to playing games is that same kid show that I mentioned, GCV. Eventually they aired the very first episode of Dragon Ball Z. And this was, a, because I'd grown a love in this type of animation from Pokemon, Dragon Ball Z is really what captivated me in terms of story. I absolutely felt so in love with um, the characters, as is still evident with all my figures there, Dragon Ball Z clothing, but um, it was just this show that was mesmerizing to me in the way that w they were always overcoming just these different challenges to defeat new enemies that were stronger and stronger, and you know, something like more of an archa archetype in other stories. You know, Pokemon had its own challenges and stuff too, but it was just something about this was a moment I felt like this is, I became aware like this is a Japanese show. Um, not a Western show with an aesthetic like that because I wasn't too sure with Pokemon. Again, this is really before the days of the internet and stuff. Um, so it was sort of, you know, I, I didn't know immediately if that was a Japanese show per se, but there was something very unique about the art style. But Dragon Ball, I learned very quickly that was a Japanese show. Um, and, uh, then that made me want to sort of like see more of these animes that would come out. Digimon eventually came out and so on and that was really like that's what I was doing and Pokemon was just that one game that I had the only RPG that I had and the only Japanese associated game but then uh, one day my mum and I were at the local video store, Video Easy here and I remember at least to my recollection on the TV they were showing trailers for movies and games and one was Final Fantasy VIII. I remember seeing like the opening cinematic or something about the game and then later on I was maybe 11 or so, um, maybe 10, at a friend's house and uh, my friend's brother actually came home with a copy of Final Fantasy VIII and he put it in and I got to see that opening. I was like, that's that game that I saw in the store and you know, I, I, I felt similar aesthetics like I could tell there's something different about the way that they look compared to Western shows at the time and, and, and Western games and it seemed very story driven from what I was watching and seeing Squall um, and Cypher fighting. Um, it reminded me a bit of Dragon Ball Z and I was like, I had to get this. And this is where my parents have again shaped sort of the direction and my interest in games is that my mum was so awesome enough to um, take me to the local Kmart and she bought me a copy of Final Fantasy VIII. This is a PS1 that I'd gotten not long before and at the time the only PS1 games I had were Crash Bandicoot and so on and I played some Spyro, Gran Turismo 2 but this is my first time really getting into a JRPG. Although Pokemon was like that this was something where it was my first experience on a home console playing a game like this. It was my first experience playing a game that was heavily story, narrative driven. And from there, it just spread like that with my interest. You know, later on, my parents would get me Final Fantasy IX when that came out. Um, I managed to get Final Fantasy VII from someone who knew my father work-wise. They gifted it to me. And then um, I remember seeing The Ledge of Dragoon at um, the local Kmart. And I thought the cover looked so cool and, I, you know, I showed my mum and um, 
after maybe some time had passed, she said, okay, we'll get this for you as a gift. I don't know if it was a birthday gift or so on, but to this day, I still have that copy of Ledger of Dragoon, Final Fantasy IX, Final Fantasy VIII, Final Fantasy VII, um, through my father's work colleague. And, you know, that's sort of like uh, nearing the end of sort of things that my parents got for me gaming-wise, but the final one, I'd say, was when the PlayStation 2 came out, obviously Final Fantasy was this series that I was just so engrossed in, and Final Fantasy X was the next one. And I'd see uh, in magazines, sort of like some information on Final Fantasy X, it was just, it was like, I had to get this, this was the next one. Um, and it was on the brand new console, there was voice acting, I was just like, this is like the next stage in video game storytelling, you know, within the capacity of the hardware like an evolution in a sense, even though that stuff existed in its own capacity in certain games on previous consoles, I had never personally experienced the game with voice acting or so on, and being a Final Fantasy, it's like, i got to get this, but um, my parents couldn't afford a PlayStation 2, so for my birthday, they said, we can get you an Xbox, because it was cheaper. So... You know, I was a bit sad, but at the same time, I was so grateful to um, for them to gift me that. And I thought, Halo is this new game. I saw Blinks of Time sweep in. I was like, okay, I'll get an Xbox. So I got that. Um, came home, turned it on, tried to use it, but it kept freezing. And then when I could eventually get it to work properly, this is all in the same day, I noticed there was a save file for a game. I believe it might have been a Star Wars game or something, but it was already on the console and this didn't add up because obviously I hadn't owned any games at this point in time. I think we were just renting a copy of Halo from the vi uh, video game store, uh, video store I should say. And uh, so I told my parents and we took it back and it turns out, I think someone had bought the Xbox before, returned it and then they had resold it as new. Um, and I got that. So now that we'd taken it back, we were sort of a bit sour. Well, my parents were sour from the Xbox experience. And given they'd already paid for the Xbox, um, the store said, well, if you'd like to get a PS2, you just have to pay the extra difference. And at this point, my parents decided, you know, they, were, they said, if I really wanted to get the PS2, that, that would be it, like my final console for say, or at least, you know, for a a lengthy period, um, so I said yep, and I was so happy, and we did. And what's special about that is, to this day, I still own that PlayStation 2. I've still got it fully boxed, it's just somewhere up there behind me. Um, and it is also the final console that my parents bought for me. After that, it's, yeah, everything was sort of like on my own terms, you know, money I would save up and so on. So it's something I cherish so much for that. And the PS2 is still my favorite console. And then that allowed the gateways to open for me to get Final Fantasy X. I have one of the best experiences with that game. I remember I had to save up for a memory card and everything. It might, maybe my parent, my mum bought me the memory card. We got a third party Mad Cats one, which still works to this day. So it always uses my primary memory card. But um, it was just special that my parents were open to allowing me to experience some of these things. Um, there definitely was a lot of, you know, um, no playtime, turn the TV off. We were also always sharing like one, CRT TV and um, you know I also have a fondness for CRT ga gaming on a CRT I should say because I grew up with that um, and as if you can find a CRT you know especially with component input or anything um, and get good HD retrovision component cables like for the PS2 or something they can look amazing on the on the TV but um, yeah you know that sort of really a culmination of certain moments in time where my parents have seen me be fascinated by something and it could be partly because I discovered that through TV or partly I became more fascinated by that because of previous experiences due to my parents you know already having a console at home and so on that um, I then developed such a huge love that took me bit by bit down the direction to where almost everything I play 
today at JRPGs and I can always associate it back to my parents, even with just the console that I play a lot of these JRPGs on, my original PS2. And I remember that actually the final thing that happened with my PS2 was my father took me to a computer swap meet and there was a gentleman there who would put mod chips in the PS2 to make them region free for both PS1 and PS2 games. Uh, so we got it mod chipped and it was funny because I opened up the box for my original PS2 and I found the original receipt in there for the mod chip and underneath my PS2 it's still got the mod chip sticker that he put on I think it was the Modbo 2.1 so um, you know because of that I was able to you know into my adulthood uh, import games from North America um, and play them on my Australian PS2 so it's very special and obviously you know my it's um, it's not only that they've they're things that they were so wonderful in doing for me growing up um, means everything when it comes to gaming but just sort of the reflections of their actions in so many other aspects of my life that you know influence me today career wise um, care wise uh, you know just sort of uh, ways that I really appreciate and respect them and in a time that's been so challenging, I'm so grateful that I've got such loving memories that have connections to things that I enjoy outside of my time with my parents, hobbies and so on. And it makes me even more grateful that, you know, I've, um, I've still got this time with them. So I guess, you know, in saying all that, um, you know, I, I can't speak for everyone's experiences with their parents. Um, maybe you had um, short experiences with your parents. Maybe your parents are still with you. Maybe you had more positive or, or less positive experiences. Maybe there were other people in your life that were guardians or mentors. But um, yeah, cherish, cherish every moment you can with them. Um, you know, do the best for them and the best by them and so on. And um, obviously, you know, it's, it's not a one size fits all with these things, but, um, you know, I thought this is a great way to really, um, really capture some of the things I'm, you know, I'm reflecting on recently and specifically in regards to my hobbies, um, and to share that with you all, it means a lot. So, um, Thank you everyone, take good care. Hopefully I will get to see you all again. It's it's very much just dependent on the health of my parents and my own health. But um, until then, take good care everyone. And uh, yeah, until the next video, stay spot on.